thank you for being with us. Um, we're real excited about another Takeo Tuesday. Uh, and hopefully the weather's nice where you are. I'm looking out the window right now here in New Hampshire. It just came out. It's actually like a nice, beautiful, it's a beautiful mid-April day. Of course, it's early May, but hey, you take what you can get, right? And I hope everybody's dealing with the quarantine uh, as best you can. Um, we know from our end that we've had just a ton of people attending our, our online sets, whether it's our Takeo Tuesdays, our Takeo at Dark on Wednesday nights, um, and, and a variety of sessions that we've been running for, for customers all throughout the country uh, since really the end of March. And uh, the response has been fantastic. I know everybody's itching to get back to work and I understand that. And we know this won't last, but uh, let's let's make the best of it while we can, shall we? Uh, a couple things I need uh, for housekeeping before we get started on our, our presentation. The first, I wanna make sure everybody can hear me and knows how to ask a question. So we can kill both of these things in one at one try. There's a little cartoon balloon on your control panel, and that should be that should link you to uh, uh, the, the the function to ask questions. So I want you to ask. Just type, click on that, and type in, "Hey, hello, how are you? Very good. All right, people hear me. That's good news. All right, so that part is in place. Um, so good. I got. Oh boy, everybody popping on there. That's fantastic. Excellent. Uh, so the other thing, just again for housekeeping, is um, do me a favor and uh, just treat this. As you would treat a uh, as you would treat a classroom experience, uh, when you're online, it's really easy to kind of get lost. It's kind of easy to uh, yeah, yeah, the the voice in the background starts to sound like the grown-ups in Charlie Brown, you know, wah 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 wah, and you, you know, you go you quick check Facebook, you check your email, and all of a sudden this becomes white noise in the background, and then it's a waste of your hour, and, and it's it's not really working for you. So. It, this takes a little bit of effort, but, tr but try to treat it as you would treat a, a classroom experience, meaning make sure you have a pen and a pad of paper right in front of you and do what you sh would do in a classroom, which is to take notes. Take notes is a very powerful way for you to stay focused and stay interested on in what's going on. So so that's really the biggest thing I can I can I can suggest to you is take notes. All right. Take notes. And then. Uh, if you have a question, please type it in. We'll be taking breaks every few slides to see if there are any questions uh, that, that come up. My, my, my compatriot, Dave Holdorf, is manning the question, uh, the question booth. And uh, Dave, I'm sure you're out there and Dave will be uh, able to uh, uh, chime in with some questions in a timely manner. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll go from there. A uh, question came up already about are we going to get the slides? Unfortunately, we're not allowed to ch share the slides, but you will have access to a recording of this webinar. Uh, you'll get that in an email, follow-up email tomorrow, uh, right around this time. You'll get an email with a link to the recording as well as a, 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 an attachment for a, a certificate for one hour uh, for you to download. So that'll be available for you. Alrighty then, let's get started on steep curves, flat curves, and variable curves. And again, I just want to make sure everybody knows Cinco de Mayo falling on a on Takeo Tuesday. Is that a coincidence? I think not. And I like this one. I found this one also this morning. This year, Cinco de Mayo falls on Takeo Tuesday. I think it's Taco Tuesday, but we're going to call it Takeo Tuesday. This is it, people. This is what we've been training for. So I hope everybody's ready. Yeah, Uber Eats isn't going to be delivering tacos today, unfortunately, unless you ordered them. So. So let's get into let's get down to business. Steep curves, flat curves, and variable curves. What do they mean, and why do they exist? Why do some circulators have curves that look a little bit steeper? Maybe if you're a skier, they might look like a you know a blue square. And why are other circulators you know more of a flat curve? They if you're a skier, they might look like a, a you know a, a green circle. You know why are they different? Why do we have different ones? What's the point? What's the purpose? Well, we're going to get into that discussion. But I want to start with this. There exists in our world, in residential hydronics, this thing we call the heat, no heat line, right? Obviously, if we're above it, we've done good. If we're below it, not so much. Customers aren't happy. Nobody's happy. Nobody's getting paid. If we're above it, that should be all we care about, right? Well, not necessarily all we care about. All too often, because the real world you know, is a is a is a is an unforgiving mother. I'll give you that. The real world, you know, ex, you know, tends to rule all. You know, sometimes that's what we get done. All right. The real world is the real world. So as long as nobody's freezing to death and blaming us, we tend to think, hey, we've done our job. Life is good. Well, there's a little bit more to it than that. If you think about it, 
People not freezing to death and blaming you is kind of like the bare minimum requirement when you're in the hydronics business. Would, would you agree? It, it's the bare minimum requirement, meaning if I do that, everything else is gravy. I got to do that. But in reality, if you think about it, it's kind of the same thing as getting going through four years of high school with a D minus grade average. You've passed the bare minimum standards required by that class. You passed barely, but you passed. All right. And at the end of four years, if in every class you took, you got a D minus for the year, you get a diploma. You passed. You've you've achieved the minimum requirements from the state to get a high school diploma. Now get the heck out of our building. Right. I got to believe in our industry, when you guys first started, guys, ladies, and et cetera, you first started on the job and you were, you got your first day, you showed up with your lunch bag and you had your tools and you were all nice, clean uniform and you're all excited to learn this, this, this wild and crazy and wonderful world and build yourself a career. I really doubt anybody said to themselves, my goal is to work hard, study hard, learn everything I can. So someday I'm going to barely just not suck. Nobody started with that. Nobody, D minus isn't good enough. All right. We all aspire to better. We aspire to comfort. We aspire to efficiency. We aspire to putting in systems. Okay. We aspire to putting in systems as opposed to a collection of parts. Now, if you've been in any seminar I've done over the past several years, you know I believe this wholeheartedly, is there's a big difference between a system and a, and a collection of parts. It does not take a particularly impressive skill set to slap together some pipes, some fittings, some valves, some, some uh, mechanical equipment, circulators, and a boiler, wire it up, have it make fire, have the pumps come on, and deliver heat and keep people from freezing to death. That's not a hard trick. A reasonably competent handyman, not even a highly skilled one, a reasonably competent handyman could pull that off. Why do we, you know, exist as professionals? Why do we have the names on our shirts? Why do we have the signs on the truck? Why do we have licensing? Why do we have, you know, all the stuff that we do? It's because we actually look at systems. A system as defined should be something where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts and the parts themselves are not chosen for convenience or for price, but for purpose. All right. I'm using this circulator because this circulator today on this job makes the most sense. I'm using this other circulator tomorrow because on that job, it makes the most sense. All of the parts are chosen for a purpose, not necessarily convenience. So that's the difference between a professional and an amateur, in my opinion. There's also this talk about European technology and, and, and hey, the, the, the variable speed circulators we sell today, the ECM variable speed circulators did get their start in Europe. Uh, over in 2000, a company called Ascol um, was the very first company to develop and introduce an ECM variable speed circulator for residential applications. It was Ascol in, in the year 2000. A couple of others came about a year later, but Ascol was the first. Uh, several years ago, I'd say four or five years ago, uh, Taco purchased the circulator division of Ascol. And we've done uh, what we've done since then is Americanize a lot of the products that that uh, that they have available, and we're we're part of a global company now. But over in Europe, systems are different. All right, systems are just plain different. Um, what you're looking at here is your typical European heating system. All right, you have a boiler, a low loss header, and then you have panel radiators out in all of the rooms. And each panel radiator has its own dedicated supply and return. All right, it's a home run to each individual radiator. There are no central thermostats wired back to the boiler. The boiler kind of does what the boiler does. Um, there are no central thermostats. What controls the temperature level or the comfort level, you know, approximate, approximation of comfort anyway, in each room are these things on the right-hand side, thermostatic radiator valves, thermostatic non-electric modulating radiator valves. The thing that controls the comfort level in the room is about an inch and a half away from the hottest thing in the room. That's just the way it is. And this is typical, this is common, and this is the way they've been stalling heating, hydronic heating systems in Europe since the 60s, because it was the easiest way to do it. It was the most practical way to do it. So what you have, you have the modulating TRVs. The circulator itself typically runs 24 seven. They don't turn it off. I mean, they turn it on, they turn it on in September and they turn it off in May. But between September and May, that sucker's running nonstop 24 seven, all right? And the boiler does what the boiler does. Typical of these systems, 
very small pipe. Typically in the early days, these were run with like 14 millimeter PEX because 14 millimeter PEX was easy to run through existing structures in a home run uh, basis to each individual radiator. So it's done with very, very small pipe and a wide delta T, typically around 40 degrees Fahrenheit, a 40 degree delta T Fahrenheit uh, delta T. And that's done primarily, it, it keep, because the heat loads on these, these, these were uninsulated homes because in, in terms of retrofit, the heat loads were rather high. And if they tried to design to a 20 degree delta T, you'd have such a big, you know, high flow rate. You know, you'd, you'd, have a, you'd need a big pump. What a 40 degree delta T does is it drops the required flow rate to deliver the BTUs, uh, which is good for running through very small pipe. And because the flow rate has been dropped through very small pipe, we keep the head under control. It's still kind of on the high side because we're talking 14 millimeter pipe, but if we did it at a 20 degree delta T, the head would be so high, we'd need to airlift a pump to the job. So that's why um, European systems are the way they are. And that requires a very specific pumping solution. Meanwhile, over you know, basically a low flow, high head solution, a low flow, high head solution. The 40 degree delta T reduces the flow, uh, but the small pipe means we have a relatively speaking higher head. And this is all relative, by the way. Now, meanwhile, over on this side of the ocean, we don't really have a typical heating system, really. We have a little bit of everything. We've got series loop fin tube baseboards. We've got two pipe cast iron radiator systems. We have radiant floor heating. We have unit heaters. We have, uh, we have, you know, hydro wear. We've got a little bit of everything, but we do have one common thread that ties most of it together is that we have multiple zones controlled with thermostats. And we have, when, when we have enough heat in a zone, we do something kooky, crazy, and uniquely American, is we just shut everything off, all right? I know, nuts, right? Um, but that's kind of the way things are here. Now, again, historically, uh, when we had our big building boom after World War II, the, the heating systems were installed in the house as the house was being built. So we had the ability to use larger pipe. These were big structures, had relatively high heating loads. So we, when we uh, use the larger pipe and design to a 20 degree delta T, we would have a higher flow rate than a 40 degree delta T system would have, a higher flow rate, but that larger pipe means lower head. So we would have over here a higher flow, lower head pumping requirement. That's the pumping solution that would have been needed for traditional systems here. Now you get into radiant floor heating over here and other kind of uh, um, you know, systems that have been integrated, not always applicable, but by and large, more of your historic systems would, would carry this high flow, low head pumping solution. All righty, let us continue. Steep curves and flat curves. Why do steep curves exist? In the pump manufacturing world, steep curves are, you know, primarily considered uh, European style curves, Euro style curves, while um, flatter curves are known as American style curves. Again, for the types of systems that we're talking about. Uh, a, a lower flow, higher head system with small diameter pipe and a 40 degree delta T is typically lower flow, but higher head than a system using bigger pipes with a 20 degree delta T, which is higher flow and lower head. So necessity is the mother of invention here. You know, when you have high flow, low head systems, you develop flat curve pumps because that's what you need. When you have low flow, high head systems, you develop steep curve pumps because that's what you need. One isn't better than the other. They're just different and have different applications. I, I asked a guy once what, you know, uh, asked a group once about, you know, why do steep curve pumps exist? And some guy insisted because he heard it, he heard someone say it somewhere, is it, well, they're more hydraulically efficient. <sighs> in a little wet rotor 125th horsepower circulator, not that much, if at all, which I, I, I doubt the premise anyway, but in, in pumps these size, it doesn't matter. It matters not a jot nor a tittle, so to speak. So they exist because of traditional designs and specific applications. Let me know if that makes sense to you guys and if you have any questions here. Um, so just so we uh, get, get some ideas and see how we're doing out there. Uh, and let's move on while we do that. So any questions? Uh, does smaller pipe, here's one from uh, from Bill Garnett, does, does smaller pipe mean higher head or is it just less carrying capacity? Uh, it can be a little bit of both, Bill. Oh, uh, yeah. Again, if I try to run, 
you know, a, a, a half a gallon a minute through 14 millimeter pecs, I'll get a half a gallon a minute through 14 millimeter pecs. And if that's designed to a 40 degree delta T, I'll get the I'll get the BTUs I need through that. It's just a, a wider delta T. But that smaller pipe is going to deliver is going to impart more pressure loss on the on the fluid. If I tried to do um, a half a gallon a minute through half inch pecs at a 40 degree delta T, the flow rate is the same, but the head loss would be substantially lower because it's a bigger pipe. Okay, let me know if that ma if that makes sense. Uh, if that makes sense Sorry. to you. Alrighty. Now let's talk about um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's talk about uh, uh, system curves. Pump curve uh, pump curves are generated at the factory. We have a we have some machinery to do that, and uh, it, it basically it's a, it's a matter of it, it's kind of like a big vat with a pipe coming out of it. It might look kind of like this. All right. Let's see if I whoops. Let's see if I can draw one up here. Uh, boom 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 boom. It's like this, and it goes back in, and I've got a pump here. And I have a little flow control valve here and a pressure gauge here. All right. The way the way we start off is we turn the pump on and then we close this valve. So there's zero gallons per minute. And we, re we read the pressure gauge. In theory, that should be the highest pressure that gauge would read at that point. We find that PSI multiplied by 2.31, and that would be this point right here on the pump curve. All right. Next, we open up that flow valve to one gallon a minute. All right. So we go to one GPM. We read the pressure gauge, it should be a little bit lower. Okay, it's over here. Then we go to two and three and four and five and six. Read that pressure gauge multiplied by 2.31 because one PSI equals 2.31 feet ahead. And we simply mark the points on the plot, we connect the dots, and there's the pump curve. It's a pretty simple process and maybe a little more technical than that, but for our purposes, that's kind of where we need to be. Um, more with a with a fixed speed pump, more flow, less less head pressure differential created by the circulator. Now, when it comes to uh, the system curve, the system curve, the pump curve is fixed. The circulator is going to do what the circulator is going to do because the circulator runs on that pump curve. Energy in equals energy out. The circulator must run on that pump curve. A system curve is a little bit different, but it's very important. It's the hydraulic fingerprint of the system. All right, every piping system has its own unique system curve. All right, it's a function of flow and head loss. As we calculate the system's flow based on the heat load that the pump has to satisfy and the head loss based upon the friction loss the water is going to experience as it goes through the piping system. All right. Uh, the reason the system curve is important is because it's all about the intersection. The, it, no, we can do an awful lot of work to find a, you know, find that we need we need a pump that can do five gallons a minute at five feet ahead, right? But the but the minute drop my pen here, the minute we put a circulator on there, we can do an awful lot of work. It says this is where the system needs to be, but the minute we slap a pump on there. It's never going to work here. It's always going to work here. The circulator dictates the flow. The circulator dictates the flow, and it's all about that intersection. The system will always work where the system curve intersects the pump curve. Now, here's the math to figure it out, all right? Once you calculate your flow in head, this takes us back to maybe fifth or sixth grade math that we thought we'd never use. What you can do with this math formula is, I know it's five at five. Based on that math formula, I can figure out what the head would be at one gallon a minute. What would it be at two? What would it be at three? What would it be at four? What would it be at six? Blah, blah, blah. And I can plot those, I can plot those points out on the, on the graph, connect the dots, and I've created a system curve. Now in residential hydronics, you very rarely need to do this. The most important thing you do need to know is this point right here. We can do a lot of math to figure that, but we're not going to work there. This is the important part. Where is that thing going to land? And here's the thing about system curves. They're not a straight line. All right. Sometimes, depending upon the flow and head correlation, they can shoot up like a rocket ship. All right. Let's do, I'm going to do one mathematically. I'm going to show you an easier way on how to do it. All right. So let's do the math. Let's say I have a, 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 a zone, a single zone, and I have a pump for that zone. All right. And I know I have three gallons a minute at six feet ahead. 
to use this formula, head one divided by head two equals flow one divided by flow two squared, I just put in what I know. Head one and flow one I know. Head one is six feet ahead. Flow one is three gallons a minute. Now I just pick what my other flow should be. All right, I, I wanna know what the head would be at six gallons a minute, right there. I wanna know what the head would be at six gallons a minute. Now you would think, well, it should be six gallons, if it's, Three, if it's six feet ahead at three gallons a minute, at six gallons a minute, it should be 12 feet ahead, right? Doesn't work that way, all right? So let's math this thing out, and we simplify doing that sixth grade algebra we thought we'd never use again. So six divided by X equals three divided by six squared. Three divided by six is 0 0.5. 0 0.5 squared is 0.25. Now, a little bit of algebra. To get rid of this divided by X, I multiply both sides by X, all right? I, so now I have six equals 0.25 x. Now just to figure, figure to solve for x, I divide both sides by 0.25, and I find that my head at six gallons a minute is 24 feet ahead. So again, it shoots up like a rock, but rocket ship. Flow and head are 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 related. As flow goes up, head goes up exponentially. All right. So that's just a, 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 a the the math way to do it. There's an easier way, which I'm sure you're excited about. The easier way is to use a BNG system sizer wheel, uh, scale number five, and this is pretty easy to use. In the white window, whoops, here we go. In the white window, here we have GPM. All right, that's in the white window. Uh, we on the blue, these blue numbers represent feet ahead. So what you do is you line up three gallons a minute with six feet ahead, right there. Okay. And then you simply read in both directions to find your different points. So at four gallons a minute, my head is 11 feet. At five gallons a minute, my head is 17 feet. At six gallons a minute, there you are at 24. Seven, we're at about 33, all right? If I wanna go the other direction, I know at two gallons a minute, it looks like I'm at about two and three quarter. And then we go down again at one gallon a minute, I'm at like 0.7, all right? so. There, from there, you can put your points on the plot and see where you intersect, all right? Why does all this matter? Why on earth do we care residentially? Here's why, okay? Here, I put, I put these on the, on the plot, and I've, I've just plotted them on a couple of different three-speed circulators, all right? Uh, the first set of lines here is for the Taco 0015 standard efficiency. Uh, typical of any real uh, any any standard three-speed circulator you're going to see out there, the 0015 standard efficiency, the Grundfos 1558, the BNG NRF 22, they're all basically the same pump. All right, and then up top we have the 0013 three-speed. Well, here are the here are the points, and then you just like I said, you just connect the dots. All right, and the points of intersection are where the system's actually gonna operate. Now, if I only need three gallons a minute at six feet ahead, in reality, for this 30,000 BTU zone, I need to run that circulator at low speed. But everybody in the within the sound of my voice knows what's gonna happen. If someone's put in a three-speed circulator, why don't you type it in and tell me where you think that circulator's gonna be set, right? Let's, let's just, let's just, let me know where you think that three-speed circulator is going to be set. I'd be very interested in, in knowing what you think. All right. Yep. High speed three. High speed never fails. Yep. Every time. We call it contractor no callback mode. So if I need three gallons a minute at six feet ahead under design conditions, in reality, I'm at nearly five gallons a minute at 14 feet ahead. All right. Five gallons a minute at 14 feet ahead instead of three at six. Now, Here's the thing, am I gonna be above that heat, no heat line? Oh heck yes, I will be above the heat, no heat line. But couple of things, I may, at five gallons a minute, it's iffy, I may develop some velocity noise issues and maybe some erosion issues. That's a possibility, number one. But number two, I have um, I have 66% more flow than I need, all right? If we remember the universal hydronics formula that states GPM equals BTUH, divided by delta T times 500, right? Now, I started with three gallons a minute, and I'm, because we had a 20 degree delta T, I'm dealing with a 30,000 BTU zone, right? But I'm not giving it three gallons a minute, I'm giving it five. I'm still getting 30,000 BTUs, I can't get more out of it, I don't need more under design conditions, all right? 
So what's going to happen? That delta T's got to give. That delta T is going to go way down. If I if that delta T is like uh, I know, 12 or 13 tops on the coldest day of the year, I'll be very fortunate. And what happens when the delta T starts to shrink like that? Well, you're going to encourage the boiler to short cycle a little bit more on the day that it's supposed to be short cycling the least. And it gets worse from here because every day of the year, I'm delivering five gallons a minute, but every day of the year, my heat load isn't 30,000. It may be a few days of the year, my heat load's 30,000 on that zone. Uh, what if it's 50% load? Okay, that's 15,000 BTUs. This delta T is going to be six to seven. All right. And understand this, we will spend one third of the heating season. I'm sorry, take that back. We will spend 50% of the heating season, 50% of the heating season at one third load or less. So we're going to spend at least half of the heating season with a delta T less than five degrees. And that's normal. And we're going to be above the heat, no heat line. And no one's going to complain about being cold. And here's the other thing. No one's ever going to call you up and say, hey, pal, you promised me a 20 degree delta T. It's only five. Get your butt out here and fix it now. It ain't going to happen either. But what we have now is a system that in no way is as efficient as it could or should be, number one. And number two, we have a system that may short cycle some rather expensive and, and important components into an early grave before you think they should. These things don't just happen, all right? So that's the that's why the system curve and pump curve matters, and that's why understanding the difference between flat curves and steep curves matter. Uh, let's take a quick look at some questions here. Uh, any uh, any good ones in there, Dave, that you were able to see? Let's see. Yep, we got cranked yep, that bad boy up. There we go. Say again? Can you? Oh, you got me. Okay, good. I just got you. Sure. Yep. So uh, there was one up there a little while ago from Ken. It says, so if we, if we increase the pipe size or change the head, the curve is not as dramatic. I know he was talking about the system curve and and uh, whatnot, plugging into the, into the system. Right. The, the, the system curve is going to be a function of flow and head that you calculate for that system based on the pipe. Yeah. It, you can't figure out a system curve until you have the piping circuit done. Yeah. Right. It, it, the system curve is never fixed. It's It's unique for each piping circuit you do, more or less. Um, and it's based upon the flow and head you calculate for that piping circuit. Right. right. And, if, and if your head loss started to, if you're in the design phase and if the head loss uh, starts to get extravagant, starts going really high on you, then you raise, you change the pipe size, go to the next size up. And that's absolutely. also what Ken more or less answered his own question after that too. Yep. No, perfect. Lower the head and increase the pipe size. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love it when that happens. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Excellent question. Excellent question. All righty. All righty. Let us go. And it, here's a, the flow and curve equation for the system values uh, are, is for system values and not assuming any pressure drop through the boiler. Uh, good question, Ryan. Uh, well, yeah, it would. In in, in the pic case of the picture you're looking at, oh, excuse me, the case of the picture we're looking at right here. All right. Uh, it would be in, in it would be. Yeah, it would be through the whole system. It would be from the Gazauta side of the circulator all the way around to the Gazinda side of the circulator, whatever that thing has to go through. Now with a cast iron boiler, with a cast iron boiler, yeah, you take the pump, you take the boiler into account, but the boiler by and large is a big open space in the piping. It has less pressure drop than the same length of pipe. So yeah, you don't, you just consider it pipe and, and go from there. With a mod con boiler for the system pump, the system pump generally doesn't pump through the boiler. So you don't need to take that boiler head loss into account. You have a boiler pump that takes care of that. Let, let me know if that answers, if that answers your question there, because that was a good one. That was a good one. So now let's take a look at what how this plays into a zone valve system. And what we're going to learn here is with most zone valve systems, uh, most zone valve systems, flat curve pumps are your friend. All right, flat curve pumps are your friend. Steep curve pumps, not so much. All right, so let's take a look at what would happen in a zone valve system. And in this particular example, we are looking at seven gallons per minute at five feet ahead, 70,000 BTU system, three zones. The worst case zone in the system has five foot ahead. So that's what we size the pump to. So my circulator is going to need to do seven gallons a minute, all right, seven gallons a minute at five foot ahead. And right there is my operating point. All right, right there is my operating point. So let's see what happens here. Let's add a circulator to this, to this job, all right? Let's add the circulator and see what happens, okay? Uh, as we add a circulator, and this is a 007, a standard efficiency 007, traditional flat curve circulator, more or less, all right? I need to be right here, seven at five, 
but I'm really operating up here at about nine and a half. Okay, that's again, a little more flow than I need. And the delta T is gonna go down under design conditions and just get smaller from there. Now, as zones close, what's gonna happen is we keep developing new system curves. A three zone, a three zone zone valve system has seven different system curves, all right? Let's count them out together. I, I've got zone one by itself, zone two by itself, and zone three by itself. Zone one and two, zones one and three, zones two and three, and zones one, two, and three. That's seven different system curves. So what that means is I'll have seven different points of intersection along that pump curve. And as zones close, the, the, the system curve's gonna back up the pump curve, flow is gonna go down, and in this case, because it's it's still got a curve, flow is going to go down, but head defer, head pressure differential created by the circulator has to go up, but just a little bit. All right. The beauty of of flat curve pumps with zone valves is that big differences in flow. All right, say nine and a half to two, a big difference in flow results in a relatively small difference in delta P, I'm sorry, that should say delta P right there, or pressure differential created by the circulator. All right, a small difference in pressure differential created by the circulator. So why is that important? Why does that matter? Why do we prefer that? Well, let's take a look at the alternative, shall we? Let's do the same thing with a steep curve pump. Okay, again, this is kind of emulating your, um, this is emulating your, your three-speed pump at contractor, no callback mode, okay? Again, seven gallons a minute at five feet ahead. I'm still at about nine and a half gallons a minute. Hey, there, no difference. As luck would have it, there's no difference in what's going on in terms of, of flow and head. But as flow goes down, meaning as zones close, again, those system curves are fixed, man. Those system curves are the six system curves. We've just put a different pump curve on it, so we're getting different points of intersection. So as flow goes down, the head pressure differential in this case goes way up, all right? It goes way up to the point where we're up over 15, uh, maybe over, over 15 feet ahead here, all right? We're over 15 feet ahead. So now a big difference in flow equals a big difference in delta P, all right? The head pressure differential goes up. Why do we care about that? Why does that matter? Well, let me ask you this. Has, well, let me ask you this. Why do you think? Why do you think that matters? You type that in. Why do you think it matters? Why should why should we care? Because again, ain't nobody ain't nobody gonna call you up and say, "Hey, I'm cold and it's your fault." Why? 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 Does this matter? Okay. Why does this matter? Let's see what you got, people. Give us your best shot. Ba boom, boom, boom. Noise, noise. You get, you'll get some noise. What kind of noise? Yeah, you're gonna get noise in the zone valves. Anybody ever have a zone? A water hammer. There you go, James. Excellent water hammer. What you're gonna have? You may have some velocity issues depending upon the flow rate, but you're gonna have that zone valve when it closes, and, and it doesn't matter what kind it is. Bang, bang, bang. It's gonna sound like it's playing La, La Bamba. All right. I mean, bang, 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 bang. Um, it's Zone valves have a tendency to bang when closing off against this kind of pressure differential. Not so much down here, all right? So you're going to get banging zone valves. Erosion in the fittings is a velocity slash high flow rate thing. So velocity through the, you know, erosion in the fittings is based upon velocity. If it exceeds maybe, maybe four, five, six feet per second, you might see that. So that's if you have really high flow rates through, through a specific size of pipe. That can happen. You know, if I need to be down here somewhere for this this combination of zones, and I'm up here at five gallons a minute, very well may have some velocity noise. But but the, but the thing that's going to really get people calling up is says, why are my zone valves banging? Right? Why are my zone valves banging? So there is the problem right there. We don't want that. And again, we also with over pump, we're still over pumping here too. Never forget that we are over pumping here, people more flow than we need, and we are stuck with that incredible shrinking delta T, which is a much bigger problem. We don't like banging zone valves, all right? But we're still getting heat. We don't like velocity noise. We're still getting heat. When we, have, when we combine all of that, along with an incredible shrinking delta T, now we have a system that makes noise, that's got velocity issues, that may start to erode, that's nowhere near as efficient as the customer thought it was gonna be or what the system should have been.
nobody's freezing to death, but that doesn't mean you know we've we've achieved the we've achieved the goals of comfort, efficiency, and long-term operation. We've they may very well not be freezing to death, but that efficiency has gone down the window, out the window rather. It's not anywhere close to what it could or should be. And the long-term operation, no, we're short cycling things into an early grave. And that is why I believe that the circulator has more to say about overall system operation and overall system efficiency than we've ever given it credit for, all right? And it's because it's the one constant. I've heard people tell me, oh, the system's gonna do what the system's gonna do, yuck, yuck, yuck. No, the system's gonna do what the circulator tells it to do because the circulator, no matter what, has to work on that curve and it's going to make the system work on that curve. It's the way it is. All righty. So a couple more questions in here. Uh, there was one I saw as I was scrolling through, and I want to get back to it. Um, I think I know which one you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, should we pay attention balance. to too low of a head in our system? Is that the one you're looking at? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, right now I'm looking at uh, why don't we just put a balancing valve on the system? Oh, and I'm yes. going to. And Sean, I'm going to I'm going to presume you mean a flow balancing a flow balancing valve on each zone. Uh, to, to a, like a circuit setter, if that's what you mean. Uh, a circuit setter, you can set the flow for each zone, all right? You definitely can set the flow for each zone, but you still got to work on that pump curve at some point. So we may not be over, you know, we, so we're, we're kind of adding extra restriction in here. The uh, If you mean a pressure differential bypass valve, we'll discuss that one in a second. Okay. Yes, he says, uh, he says, why? Yeah, uh, um, like a circuit setter. Why don't we put yeah. one of those in instead? Yep. You can certainly put circuit setters in there or you could pick the right pump. One of the two. I mean, in this case, you'd need three circuit setters versus one correct pump. I, you know, there are there are different ways to go about this uh, that we're going to discuss. But yeah, you could definitely put flow setters on each on each zone. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, or pick the right pump in the first place and skip, skip step one. Um, it's just a matter of how you want to get there, okay? It, it, either one will work. Either one will work. All righty. Uh, here's one. Many times contractors select the pump prior to finalizing the head loss calculations. How do they manage, asked Muhammad. Uh, oh, boy. I think they guess. <laughs> I, I think they guess. I think that, well, we always use this one. It always it, It's always worked. Uh, so let's just keep doing what we've been doing and stop and don't ask so many questions. I think honestly, that might be it. Uh, for, look, for me, when I was a contractor of way, way back, I didn't know any of this stuff. And we just used the pump. We just used 007s because that's what we always used and they always work just fine. Um, it, and because the types of systems we were putting in at that time were all pretty much the same, the 007 was more pumped than we would have possibly needed anyway. We got away with it. We were above the no heat line. As far as we were concerned, it worked. When you start getting into different kinds of systems where maybe you got some PEX tubing, maybe you got a little of this and a little of that and a little of that, now all of a sudden you got to kind of pay a little bit more close attention. So good, good question. Good question. All righty. So how do we fix it? We have these options. We could stay flat. Basically, when you need a flat curve pump in a typical zone valve application, again, it doesn't apply to all of them, but it apply, certainly applies to an awful lot of them, particularly when you're dealing with a replacement circulator. Why create a problem? If the job calls for a flat curve pump, put in a flat curve pump and, and be done with it, right? Okay. We could take the detour, which means installing a pressure differential bypass valve. But, but folks, a pressure differential bypass valve is a Band-Aid for a self-inflicted wound. It's the price you have to pay for insisting on using the wrong circulator for the job. The, 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 you know, you've used a steep curve three-speed pump, basically, as, as, as we've seen, where you really need a flat curve pump. A pressure differential bypass valve does one thing, and what it does is it turns a steep curve pump into a flat curve pump. That's really all it does. There's no magic to it. That's essentially what it does. And if it if all it does is turn a steep curve pump into a flat curve pump in this application, well, why the hell not use a flat curve pump in the first place? I mean, I know crazy talk, right? That's not how the Europeans do it. I don't know. No, that's got nothing to do with how the Europeans do it. Why create a problem in the first place and then solve it? Okay, first off, why create a problem in the first place? But secondly, why create a problem in the first place and then spend some of your customers' money 
some more of your customers' money to solve the problem you just created. To me, it's completely illogical. That's the way I think. Uh, the, last, the last one is to adjust and adapt. We can adjust and adapt, and that's where we get into the variable curves, the variable curves. Dave, before we jump into that, any questions that we need to address before moving on? Oh, one of them just popped up, and it says, what is the minimum flow for the circulators? You know, only one zone open, low flow. Does the pump burn up? Good question. Does the pump burn up? Pump will get hot. When we start working way up on the top of a pump curve, that's when that's when pumps tend to get hot. Um, it, it, the bigger the pump, the more the bigger the problem. I think um, the bigger the pump, the bigger the problem. Um, but um, it, you know, in little 125th horsepower and below circulators, basically the pump's going to get hot. If it if it shuts off and it deadheads for an extended period of time, and you'd be surprised how long that time frame really is. Yeah, you can eventually burn the pump out. Uh, running it consistently, nonstop, really high on the pump curve or really far out on the pump curves, not the best thing for the pump. The sweet spot's kind of that middle third or middle middle half of the of the curve for best operation. But for a little 125th horsepower pump, Running a little bit up high or a little bit down low occasionally is not going to shorten its life significantly. Would, would you agree with that, Dave? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, once you get bigger, that's when, you know, when you look at uh, pump curves that we have for the larger circs, we usually don't go out to the very end. We want to stay in the middle for what we kind of call the sweet spot. Um, but in a small res circulator uh, like these, yeah, we're not going to we're not going to hurt them too, too, too much. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. All right. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Bill. Good question. Good question. So let's take a look now at the variable speed load down and what what we what do variable speed circulators do and how do variable speed circulators work within the parameters that we've just discussed. Still understand this. We're talking about system curves and pump curves. They still apply here. System curves and pump curves still apply with variable speed circulators. A lot of people think, well, variable speed circulator, put it in. It'll figure everything out, and it'll always adjust and always give you the right flow. Um, I've heard people saying, yeah, I put in variable speed circulators because they always give me the right flow. And that's a statement that's about 82 to 83 percent correct. What's missing is a couple of words that would make it 100 percent correct. So to say Variable speed circulators always give me the right flow. Again, 82 to 83% correct. To make it completely correct, you need two more words at the end, hardly ever. All right, variable speed pumps give me the correct flow, hardly ever, hardly ever. That makes it 100% correct, as we shall see. So let's, let's uh, take a look. Again, as we said, system curves, pump curves, they don't go away just because we have a variable speed pump. I don't, you know, people try to say, well, it doesn't matter. No, it does matter. Absolutely does matter. Uh, so we talk about variable speed pumps. We also talk about variable speed pumps that work via delta T or delta P. All right, delta T or delta P. And the thing that makes these things, they, they, basically what they do is they take different information from the system, they use information from the system to determine how fast they should go. Uh, Delta T pump uses the supply, the difference between the supply water temperature and the return water temperature to determine how fast it should be. You program in the designed for Delta T into the pump. The pump if, it, if the system's designed for 20 degree Delta T, you program that pump to run on a 20 degree Delta T. In fact, it comes out of the box program for a 20 degree Delta T. And what it'll do is whatever the water temperature is going out to the system, it'll sense that and it'll have a sensor on the return side to sense the temperature of the water coming back and it'll speed up and slow down to try to keep it at 20 degrees. All right. Why not? It seems to make sense. It seems to be logical. Um, as zones open. All right. We start to take more energy out of the fluid at that particular flow rate. The water temperature starts to come back a little bit cooler. That's going to tell the, the, the pump that the delta T is getting wider than 20, and that's going to be a signal for the pump to speed up. Zones close. We're taking less energy out of the fluid. The delta T is going to want to get smaller. That's going to be a signal for the pump to slow down. So it slows down and speeds up based on zones opening and closing, based on the return water temperature and, and keeping it within 20 degrees of the supply water temperature. The same thing happens as it gets colder outside too, folks. 
as it gets colder outside, we're pulling more energy out of the fluid and the delta T is going to start to get wider at a certain at a certain speed. If this pump senses that the delta T is starting to get wider, it's going to speed up. So a, a, a delta T pump is going to go a little faster in January and a little slower in October and April. That's just the way it works. Delta P is a pressure differential or varying resistance circulator. It varies its speed to maintain a specific pressure differential within the system, and it judges that by reading essentially resistance against the impeller. Let's say I got three zones open and the, the, the impeller's impellerating going round and round and round at a certain speed and the pump's happy, then a zone closes, right? When a zone closes, all of a sudden that impeller is spinning against a little bit more resistance. If that impeller's spinning against more resistance, what does that tell the circulator to do? tells it to slow down. I don't need as much. Another zone closes, more resistance. She slows down yet again. And then when zones open, vice versa. Thing about a delta P pump, it doesn't know from April to January. It, it's going to run the same speed in April as it does in January, as it does in October, because it doesn't, it can't interpolate the actual load. Okay. It's just going to run shorter based on what the thermostat tells it, you know, in, in a zone valve application. Let's take a look at a delta P, or I'm sorry, the, the delta T, the delta T um, uh, uh, <clears throat> pump performance curve chart. And this is for the Takeo VT2218. And you see our minimum speed here with line A and our maximum speed here with line B. Uh, and they said that big green wedge is kind of, it'll run in there wherever it needs to. I, you can't really call it a self-sizing pump because it's not the most accurate of terms, but it, it's re, it, it's closer than any other circulator in terms of self-sizing. Meaning, say I'm back to that seven gallons a minute, five foot ahead zone valve system, okay? And I'm I'm installing this pump on the quote unquote coldest day of the year, all right? Well, what it's going to do, as long as my calculations are all spot on and everything is is 100% accurate, which it isn't, but we're going to just presume. Well, this is where it, what's going to happen is that's, that, uh, that system's going to find, whoops, let me go back here real quick. It's going to find that this is the maximum operating curve. So I'm seven gallons a minute at five feet ahead. All right. Now the, the, the wattage range for this circulator is a minimum speed of nine watts and a maximum of 59. From the looks of things here, I'm at maybe just about halfway. So under design conditions, my maximum speed might be at about 30 watts, okay? Now, that's with all zones calling. Somewhere in here, we're going to find the flow and head for the smallest zone. Let's just say it's here. And this is going to be my pump curve for the one smallest zone calling. So under design conditions, as zones open, the pump's going to go faster until I reach that curve. As zones close, I'm going to go slower until I reach that curve, all right? Now, as it gets warmer out, What's going to happen as it gets warmer out? Boom! This curve and all of the curves are going to move back down this way because GPM equals BTUH divided by delta T times 500. If my BTUH drops because it's getting warmer out, my delta T stays the same. The flow rate required has to go down. So what's going to happen is as it gets warmer, we're going to drop down, down, down until at some point, people, at some point, we have a nine watt fixed speed circulator. At some point, we're going to have a nine watt fixed speed circulator. And that, in this case, might be at about 50, 50 to 60% load. All right. Now, a nine watt fixed speed circulator is pretty darn good compared to an 85 or 95 watt fixed speed circulator. All right. Uh, we're not going to have a 20 degree delta T the whole time, but it's a damn sight better than two or three. The other thing in maintaining as wide of a delta T as we possibly can for as long as we can, we enhance the efficiency of the system. We're not crippling it with the incredible shrinking delta T. We're trying to keep it as wide as possible. Very good, very good. So there's your delta T solution. Now let's talk about delta P in a constant pressure mode and how that works with system curves. In delta P, constant pressure is kind of like your ultimate flat curve pump. Constant pressure is your ultimate flat curve pump. And it is the proper, uh, it's the proper operating mode to select for zone valves, for on-off zone valves like we use in this country. Um, constant pressure is basically a flat curve pump, all right? So let's say we set our, our pump to a 10 foot ahead constant pressure like we have here. Now, I, it's a variable speed circulator, but this 10 foot ahead constant pressure line, as well as out here, this curve right here is now a fixed performance curve. The system will work 
somewhere on that red line, on these red lines, somewhere on the red lines, wherever the system curve intersects the pump curve. All right, let's make sure that, that make, I wanna make sure that sinks in. That red line that I just drew there, that red line is a fixed performance curve. The system will perform somewhere along that curve. All right, that curve is fixed and the system will operate where system curves intersect the pump curve with a constant pressure application. So again, seven gallons a minute, five foot ahead, that's where I want to be. Now let's, uh, let's, let's draw the, uh, the system curve. The system curve is like so. So what it's doing is it's intersecting right here, okay? It's intersecting right here. So it's not gonna go above 10 foot ahead, but instead of operating out here, which in this case is a 44 watt pump performance curve, it's operating on this curve. So there's a kajillion of these curves that have been programmed into the brain and it will drop from one to the other. So instead of going at 44 watts, maybe that's 33 watts per se. Now, when a zone closes, when a zone closes, so let's say I have a new system curve, all right? This is my, this is my operating point, but now I have a, a zone closes, I have a new system curve. So the way this thing will actually work is for like a nanosecond and a half, we're gonna work up here like it normally would on if that was a fixed curve circulator, right? It's gonna work up there for a nanosecond as, for about as long as it takes for that impeller to note that there's more resistance, all right? As soon as it notes that there's more resistance, then bang, it's gonna drop right back down to that 10 foot ahead constant pressure line to the point where it looks kind of like that, okay? So now I'm operating on this curve, which is less than 33 watts. So maybe now we're down to 30 watts. Another zone closes, we go up and down again. It's gonna look like we're just sliding right across, okay? And maybe now we're down to 25 watts, and then maybe now we're down to say 20 watts or whatever it might be, okay? We're maintaining that constant pressure and the system has to work on that line. That's why we say, they give me the they give me the they give me the, the the right flow hardly ever. All right. Because I need to be down here. I need to be down here. But at 10, if this is where I program that circulator, I'm going to operate up there on the fixed performance curve. Dave, how are we doing for questions? We are doing really well right now. So uh we had we did have one question more on the dynamics of the design of the circulator itself, more on commercial, but hopefully, David, what we just showed you here was showing you how a delta P circulator works. He was looking for the difference um, on variable torque com uh, commercial circulators and uh, being designed with delta P like we have here. So uh, that part, we know the one side of it very well ourselves. Unfortunately, you know, I know John and I don't have that much detail on pre-programmed uh, variable torque circulators on on um, on the larger drive style systems. Take a look and and maybe give uh, one of our commercial uh, engineers a, a call if you want. Right. We, we what we we'll do is we we can cap your your email address and make sure that gets addressed for you. So let's take a look now at. Uh, uh, the Taiko 0015E3 for an example. This is a three setting delta P pump. You know, if you like three speed pumps, what this does, it's the same thing. It's a three setting pump, but it is variable speed in the low and medium settings. At high, it's a full speed fixed speed pump, but um, it addresses some of the shortcomings in that low and medium, whoops, low and medium are flat curves like we want for zone valves. So let's say we did have that seven gallons a minute, five foot ahead, right? And I picked the five foot ahead constant pressure line. Well, okay, here's your system curve. Your system curve is gonna go like that, bada bing, we're right there. As zones close, all right, as zones close and we have new system curves, you can see a couple of things. We're, good, we're still gonna be operating on a, on a fixed curve, but it's a much lower one. Under design conditions, for the most part, we're going to have 20 degree delta T's, hopefully, for the most part. Uh, as it gets warmer out, we're not, you know, but it's better than having two to three, two or three degree delta T's, all right? So it's, it's better, it's not perfect, but it is better. In addition, 
I'm working on pump performance curves way down here. So maybe at most I, I have maybe 25 watts and maybe down here I could I could be working at seven or eight watts as as a uh, as opposed to you know 95 watts with a with a with a uh, you know a three speed pump set to contractor no callback mode. So now my electrical consumption goes way down. It eliminates the cost of the pump in about a year, maybe. All right. And if you're in a rebate state. <laughs> it's gravy after that, um, uh, you know, but it eliminates the additional cost of the circulator in, in, in no time, and it gets that system working better and closer to where the customer might be expecting it. You're getting closer to the efficiency that the system's looking, that the that the system promises, right? And you're gonna you're gonna slow down that wearing out of components. Basically, we're doing a better job here. So that's kind of a look at the 0015 E3, and then. I just want to really quickly share with you a little bit about the 0018E and its Bluetooth capabilities. Uh, this opens up the 0018E is is it's a multi-feature, multi-function uh, delta P pump. Uh, I can run a proportional delta P if I have thermostatic radiator valves. I can run constant delta P for zone valves, or I can uh, I can adjust my uh, I can adjust my fixed speed for zone pumps if I want. Because here's the thing about a Delta P pump, you know, like uh, this one right here, our previous Delta P pump. In a zone valve job, it's gonna vary its speed, right? But what if this was a single zone? What if this was just the single zone, 70,000 BTUs, five foot ahead? If this was just the sing, if it was just a single zone, is that gonna be a variable speed pump, I ask you? The, the, the answer is no, it's not gonna be a variable speed pump. It's gonna find its happy spot on this curve, and that's where it's going to run every time it comes on. Because again, this, this pump is reacting to changes in pressure differential. When you use a delta P pump as a zone pump, there's nothing in that zone that's going to change the pressure differential. So it's going to find its happy spot and run one speed, one speed only. A delta T pump, you have some opportunity, depending upon the size of the zone, for the circulator to vary its speed. But the smaller the zone, the less likelihood you are of having that actually happen or happen very much. A bigger zone, yeah, you might see some speed variations. Smaller zone, it might be very, very little, depending upon how badly you overcook the, the loads, too. If you overcook the loads a lot, maybe, maybe it'll never vary its speed at all. It'll just be a fixed speed 9-watt pump, which isn't bad, but that's a very real possibility. Now, what, um, what, what the 0018E allows us to do is it basically gives us a, an app that, not, that connects to the pump and it gives us a look inside the pipe. It gives us this, 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 this insight into what's going on inside the pipe and allows us to set up a circulator about as well as a circulator can be set up uh, in a very simple, very simply and very quickly. All right, as I said, it's a multifunction delta P. So we have constant pressure, infinitely variable fixed speed. So instead of a three speed pump, let's say if you go watt by watt, you got a 43 speed pump. If you go half watt by half watt, it's an 86 speed pump. You know, go off, go, go from there. Uh, for those pressure differential, or for those, uh, um, sorry, for those uh, um, uh, thermostatic radiator panel, radiator valve panel radiator, uh, two pipe type systems, we have proportional pressure. And for those panel radiator two pipe systems, we have something called active adapt, where it re, it takes a it's run it's intended to run on continuous circulation and in a TRV application, uh, it kind of reads changes as those TRVs modulate. It'll read changes, and if if the change is long enough and significant enough, it could change the the performance curve that it's working on. All right, a active adapt. You may have heard of auto adapt. They're basically the same thing. Uh, you try and use those in a in a zone valve application. What you're going to find with zone with on off zone valves, what you're going to find is it's not doing what you think it does. It's just going to default to a high setting, and 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 that'll be that. All right, it's not really thinking or figuring anything out for you. So let's take a look at this thing in the infinitely variable fixed speed mode. So let's get that zone where I had three gallons a minute at six feet ahead, right? This is looking at the app, all right, the app on your iPhone or your, your, your Android or an iPad or something like that. What you can do with this is, is this thing here is a slider. You put your finger on it and you can slide it back and forth up and down that 100% scale. And what's that, what that does is it changes the speed of the pump. 
And what will happen is uh, down in that lower right hand corner, you see this big old blue ball, right? Or half of a blue ball. Uh, as you slide that, that dot on the slider back and forth, that ball will move around, okay, to find its right spot. And what it'll do is you move it till you, down at the bottom, it gives you a readout of flow and head. What you do is if you know the flow, you move it until the readout at the bottom says three gallons a minute, if that's what you need, and it'll figure out the head. It may not be at six. If it really only needs to be at five, it'll be at five. It needs to be at seven, it'll be at seven. But if you tell it the flow, it'll find that spot on the flow where it needs to be. And, and then that'll tell you basically the system curve. Because if you were to speed that thing up, uh, the, the, it'll bop around a little bit as it's trying to figure out where it is. But as we go to four gallons a minute, it'll be here. We go to five gallons a minute, it'll be here. We go up to six gallons a minute, it'll be over here. I mean, that's kind of how it works. It'll, it'll follow the system curve for you. Uh, but it gives you the ability to size that pump about as well as it can be sized. Okay. All you need to know is the flow rate. All you need to know is the flow rate. In a zone valve application, it's kind of the same thing. All you need to know is the is the flow rate. In the zone valve application, remember our, our 0015E3 had two constant pressure settings and then the fixed then the full speed fixed speed. Uh, the 0018 in constant pressure actually has one two two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine constant pressure settings. And you can change from one curve to the next by one of two ways. If you see up here, you can go up or down using those arrows and you'll go from C1 to C2 to C3 to C4, or simply by using your finger and touching the line you want, you'll make it change from there too, because you got a touch screen on your phone. So our zone valve system was seven gallons a minute at five foot ahead. Now, all I know, if I know it's seven gallons a minute and I know it's five foot ahead, I just touch the five foot ahead line and bing, I'm gone. I'm done. All right. It'll, it'll take care of everything from there and it will work on this curve. If I don't know the head, but I do know the flow, then what you do is you actually go back here to, to the fixed speed. All right. And you adjust your circle until you, until this dot goes to seven gallons uh, to seven gallons a minute or your desired flow rate in this case would be maybe in this example would be seven gallons a minute once it reads seven gallons a minute it'll tell you the head and there's a little readout down at the bottom that'll tell you what the head loss is and if it says five feet ahead well okay i know it's seven gallons a minute it's telling me five feet ahead so i go back here i simply press the five foot ahead line and i'm done all right glorioski we're finished and that's about as easy and about as effective and about as simply as you can as you can program a circulator because what this is actually doing is you're not guessing you're not presuming what you're doing is you're looking at the actual hydraulics of the system and you're telling it i want it to be five gallons or seven gallons a minute it's telling me it's five foot ahead bam that's how i'm going to program it so it takes a lot of that uh it, it takes a lot of the guesswork out of this out of the system not by magic, not by relying on fairy tales, but by actually seeing the reality inside of the system for yourself with your own eyes. So that's, uh, again, the, the, the advantage of that sort of a thing. So I hope this discussion on uh, different types of, uh, of circulators and different types of pump curves has been useful to you. Uh, what I want to do now is I just want to... Uh, uh, basically open it up to your questions and um, kind of see where we're at and, and see what, 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 the, what the dealio is, how are you guys doing and um, what. Uh, well, we did have a question, question come in, have? John. Oh, uh, we got a bunch the, coming in, excellent. Yeah, we've got a couple, yep. So one, one of the questions came in was, how does the pump measure the head? All right, so I guess we just want to review, it's not really measuring the head itself, it's, it's looking at an RPM, and an amp draw and it's going to do a calculation to figure out what speed it's going to run at so there are no pressure sensors built into the system itself or the right. circulator yeah none of the none of these circulators uh it doesn't matter who makes them and none of the circulators down in this in this uh in this level are um are uh, uh what we would say um what's the word i'm looking for we are are um have pressure sensors built in a lot of people say, oh, that's got sen internal sensors. No, none of them do. They don't have internal sensors. It's a it's a mathematical interpolation of, as Dave said, the RPM of the impeller and the resistance, which is inferred as amp draw, 
uh, by the by the by the brains. It does a little bit of math and says, yeah, okay, here's about what it is. Is it 100% accurate? No, probably 95% accurate, 98% accurate. It's pretty darn accurate. Is what we've found. So uh, that uh, um, so that was that was a terrific question. That one came from Evan Cornell, I think. Yep. Um, let's see what else we got here. Uh, a project with multiple 0018s. How do you Bluetooth to multiple circulators? Do you address them? Good question, Gary. Yeah, you can name them. You can name them. Like say you had three circulators. You can name them Mo, Larry, and Curly if you wanted to. You just do one at a time. So you shut two of them off, turn one on, you use your app, you connect to that one, you immediately name it. Again, let's call it, this one's going to be Mo. You name that one Mo. You program that one. You shut it off. You turn on Larry, all right? You name it Larry, and then you, you, you program that one, shut it off, and then you go to Curly. And if you have more, then you go to Shemp, Curly Joe, Joe. Um, I think we've run out of stooges, but if you if you have if you have more than six stooges, more than six pumps, you need more than six stooges. So yeah, that's how you would do that. You 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 just do one at a time, and you measure. Uh, then you name it, and then you program each one at a time. So okay. Another good. another question came in is when is the payback on using a VFD pump over constant speed slash three speed circulators came in from Bill O'Donnell. A v a VFD. If you're talking commercially. Um, that I, I I've never done the math on on the larger commercial pumps and and I bristle at the word payback anyway um, in terms of uh, because it, payback and somehow means it's going to pay for itself and it they never they don't pay for itself it's a circulator you you're buying it and you're feeding it energy and it's giving you flow all right you make that deal you can't renegotiate that deal all right it circulators never pay for themselves they use energy and they do a job for you. I think the, the word you're looking for, and maybe this is just semantics on my part, it's offset. At what point does the electricity I don't use to run it offset the additional cost compared to, let's say, a 0015, e, a 0015 versus a 0015 E3? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And it's going to depend on a couple of things, how well you program it, all right, how well you program it, and your cost per kilowatt hour. We've seen things, if they're programmed just so, if they're programmed properly, uh, we've seen that offset in less than two years, which is that point is pff, nothing, you know, it's nothing. Uh, a lot of the New England states, a lot of states in the Northeast actually have incentives and, and you know, rebates and things through the utilities to help offset the installed costs. At that point, pff, there's nothing to talk about here in terms of offset. But in, 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 in areas where there are no incentives or rebates, it depends on the pump you buy, but it's going to be a, in just in terms of electricity, a couple of years max, I think. Um, but what you got to look at, that's the cherry on top of the Sunday. In my opinion, what you got to look at is how does this circulator impact the efficiency of the system? How does this circulator impact the incredible shrinking delta T? How does this circulator impact potential short cycling? If I can do that, if I can save a little, if I can you know, lengthen out those run times by keeping the delta T as wide as possible for as much of the winter as I possibly can. I mean, why, why, as wide as possible within the design parameters of the system, and keep and and, and keep it keep it as wide as I can throughout the heating season. That's the big picture, man. That keep the eyes on the prize. That's the big picture. That makes that system work that much better and that much longer. Um, you know, I. It's, the, the electrical savings is nice. You get into bigger pumps. Now you start talking about over one horse, man, or even three quarter horse. We're having a different discussion in terms of watts, okay? We're having a much different discussion. Uh, that's going to be much quicker if it's a big difference in wattage, absolutely. But in these little guys, it takes, it takes very little time. Is green program still uh, programmed into the OE circulators? Yes, they are. Dave, do you have the specifics on that? I do, I do. Well, one, we don't have it in the uh, in the 18E, so it's not in the 18 circulator. It's just going to be in the 7E and the 15E3, and that is after a seven-day runtime, actually almost eight days uh, of a continuous runtime. Then we drop it into the um, proportional pressure mode, uh, where we're assuming it's going to be run for a constant circulation system, thermostatic radiator valve zone, uh, system. So yes, we still have them in there, but we have changed that to a an eight day uh, staging of that compared to the first run a couple of years ago. Small batch of them around 24 hours of runtime. So, right, yeah, it's it's it, 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 
what we we program is that if the pump was going to run for X amount of time, we figured, okay, then it was running, then it's being run in a, a constant circulation mode and should turn to a proportional, uh, a, a proportional delta P. Uh, what happened is in a couple of really weird locations, uh, weird situations, we had a really long cold snap, and they went, they even though it wasn't an on-off situation, they went into that uh, green mode. So we extended the time before it does, and it works much better that way. Will you continue to make the 007Z pumps? I'm guessing you mean the 007E, Jerry, if that's uh, the case. I'm going to assume the, the zone pump, the one that has the, um, the the relay built into it. Oh, okay, the zone pump. If, if you mean the one that has the relay built into it, yes, as long as, as, long as uh, the DOE lets us. Uh, the DOE, we, we, we expect the DOE to say all circulators must be of this type of 23 uh that's what i'm thinking that, that could change but that's what that's kind of what we're looking at um uh in terms of of those of those guidelines commercially the guidelines went into effect this past january 22nd for anything one horse and above uh the smaller pumps they're looking at 2023 perhaps uh which model would you recommend for chw and a delta t of 16 is that for a chilled water application, Delta T of 16? Our, our Delta T pump, the VT2218, uh, as long as that the parameters fit what you're trying to do, and it may or may not, but a Delta T pump would certainly make a lot of sense there. Ours does work in a chilled water mode. So uh, maybe that, if, let me know if that helps you, if that helps answer your question. All righty, what else we got up here, Dave? We just got a new one that just popped in from Jeremy. Can the ECM circulator be adjusted for different fluid types? Uh, example, 25 or 50% glycol since flow and head are not directly measured. I can't uh, speak to larger ones. I don't believe so. Uh, these, no. They just, they, they're they just going to work on the, on the, on the 10 foot ahead constant pressure line. And if it's got to work a little harder to get there, it's going to work. It's going to, it's going to generally speaking, it, if you set it to 10 foot ahead, it's going to work at 10 foot ahead, um, re regardless of what the fluid is. Uh, David, is, is, do you concur? Yeah. Is that the, your understanding? Oh, yeah, I'm, exactly. I'm, I think exactly. I understand that's the way, yeah. That's the way I look at it, too. And if he were to use a Delta T circulator in there, it's just going to follow the temp drop, right? So regardless of what the fluid right. is in the system, it's just looking for the temperature there. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, regardless of the fluid, it doesn't care what's inside the pipe. It just wants to, it's just uh, only, concern, it's only concerned about the temperature. Yeah. All righty, very good, very good. A uh, question from Yasser. I'm sorry, I can't share the slides. We're not allowed to, but again, you will see the, uh, you will have a link to the recording of the webinar uh, available, made available to you tomorrow. So unfortunately, I can't, we're not allowed to share the slides, but you do have the recording available, so you can review it from there, if that, if that helps you, Yasser. All righty, and, keep those questions coming. Yep, yeah, another question came in is, uh, you know, for, with he meant for that chilled water from Yuma before. Uh, mm -hmm. What recommendation do we have? Well, our uh, the VT2218 does have a minimum water temperature of 36 degrees. So if your uh, system is not operating any cooler than that, you can go with the VT2218 on that if it's going to fit your flow and head requirements that we have there. So uh, obviously with any circulators, it's also important to watch out for that condensation when you're doing anything chilled water-wise, so you're not condensing on the motor and the electronics themselves, so. Very good, very good. All righty, All right, okay, I'm just scrolling back here, see what else we have. Uh, do you ever balance on zone return water temperature? Do we ever balance on zone return water temperature? That's an interesting question, Bill. Uh, balance on balance what on zone return water temperature balance flow. I'm, going to assume he's, I'm assuming he's looking at you know do we try to choke the flow down or we put a circuit setter in for zoning to try to get that 20 degree delta and it does get tough trying to do that when you're trying to balance a zone valve system based on a delta t because it's kind of what i call dynamic balancing yeah, you, yeah, you, yes, you yes. slow down the flow in one you get to exactly to your 20 degrees then you go to adjust the other zone and it's going to change the flow in the one you just adjusted. So it does become a, a challenge to try to get it exactly. I think the, the biggest balancing that we have in any residential setting is the thermostat you have in the house. <laughs> right, um, right. So that's probably the best way to do it. We try to size and design it as close as you can um, without having to try to 
you know, put in the balancing valves. You can if you wanted to. Um, it does help, but you try to get close to your flow rather than by delta T. Yeah, it does become a challenge uh, on yeah. individuals like that. Yeah, and and again, you, and uh, Dan Kearns actually put makes out a good makes a good point here. Yeah, you would have to balance on the coldest day of the year too, <laughs> or at least half load. If or you at know least you have, have, you have to and know over ten. Half load. Right, right, yeah, right, because that's going to change with that. You know that delta is going to change, so it becomes problematic. And Dave makes a good point. It's even like balancing radiant manifolds. Uh, people think those are very real fine-tuned kind of dials and valves. It's really the the balancing valves on radiant manifold have one job, and that's to trick the water into thinking all the loops are the same length, so they <laughs> go through all of them the same. Uh, and then your your zoning takes care of the balancing. Uh, it, it, people said, well, if I get too much flow in this zone, can I choke it down? Well, you can choke that one loop down, but you're going to increase the flow in every other loop. So you're chasing your tail when it comes to balancing in that respect. So uh, probably same thing, only different in terms of balancing based on temperature, if that makes sense. Okay. For domestic hot water recirculation system using thermostatic valves instead of circuit setters, what kind of control do you recommend, delta P or delta T? Uh, thermostatic valves on a domestic hot water recirculation system. Are you talking about an under sink, that under sink valve? Is that, is that what you're talking about, uh, uh, George, or is that, uh, are you looking at something different? Um, typically with domestic hot water recirculation, uh, fixed speed is fine. You know, really, uh, it, 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 variable speed does it, that, that, uh, there's pretty much anybody who sells a domestic hot water recirculation pump will tell you to set it to a fixed speed. Whatever that fixed speed is, adjust it. If you want that infinitely adjustable thing on like a 0018 type pump, if it had a, a with a with a with a with a stainless steel volute, or our 006 E3 is a is an infinitely bari variable fixed speed pump. Uh, understand, we don't necessarily need flows to change in a in a domestic hot water recirculation system. All we're trying to do is keep the hot water line primed. Ideally, we want that thing to shut off every once in a while. So I don't think there's any need to change speeds during operation for domestic hot water recirculation. I think whatever pump you choose, and again, it should be a delta P because it's just simple. It's simpler that way, where you can adjust the fixed speed to where you need it to be. Then I think you're going to be fine. So I don't think we need to get too crazy in terms of of varying the speed because we can't. It's this again, not much is going to change. Uh, and we just want that water to get out there as quick as we can. But let me let me know if I understood your question correctly. All right, any more questions out there, gang? If not, this has been kind of a fun way to do to to share Takeo Tuesdays with you. And I hope you you've had a couple of uh, maybe you've got a margarita in your hand or or, or a, a mojito or something along those lines, and uh, can enjoy the rest of the afternoon in isolation. Um, I, Anybody out there getting outside or doing much of anything? I mean, gorgeous day today, so I'm going to get outside and do a little something something this afternoon. But, uh, you know, golf courses are closed here in New Hampshire until uh, next Monday. Uh, how are things where you are? Are you guys keeping busy? That's maybe the biggest question. Are you keeping busy? Is, is work steady? Uh, you know, are, are we, are we, uh, are we, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, we're staying good and fit and keeping the businesses going and everything like that Bob, while being social distance. So we got a beautiful day out in Jersey. Uh, Evan's going to be playing hoops with the kids in a little bit. Very good. Very good. Uh, excellent. Uh, Scott's finishing his back deck. Nice up in Ontario. Excellent. Excellent. Golf courses are open in Buffalo. Eric, I'm in the car. No, I can't get in. The, they, what they're going to do here when they reopen, I guess they're doing this elsewhere too, is when you check in, you got to show your driver's license that you are, in fact, a resident. They don't want people crossing state lines to play golf. So that's okay. That's okay. Are you going to get wow. snow in Buffalo, though? Oh, my God. Well, it's Buffalo. I guess that's that's expected. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Golf courses are open in Florida. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, still going to the office. Everything's running full bore in Alberta. Excellent, Darren. That's good. Doing a little bit of motorcycle riding out there in Pennsylvania. Very good, Ken. That's that's a that's a it's it beautiful day for that. Uh, spring spring on a motorcycle is just the best, just the best. It's golfing in Idaho. Uh, I gotta, it's gonna be the longest week of my life waiting for Monday. <laughs> <laughs> it's here in New York on Long Island. It's back open again. Yeah, stop. Just yeah, stop. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> Hiding from my wife and kids in the basement. I am trapped. Please send help. <laughs> 
we're coming down. You're, we're, we're coming down to get you, Bill. Just just shine a beacon in the air. We'll come. We'll find you. We'll find you. All right, Joe Finelli's barbecuing every day out on the deck. Wine is flowing, and you're selling Taco in Newtown, Pennsylvania. I love you, brother. Uh, golf is open, beer is cold, and people are crazy. Yes, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Hey, Scott, you got a Ducati? Oh, what a great motorcycle. Great to, great to bring the Ducati out for a ride in the hills. Absolutely. Uh, snowing in New Brunswick. All right. Uh, I assume you've got those kitten kitten golf cleats? Kitten golf cleats? With the, oh, from, oh, with the one? <laughs> that was from Wednesday night, yes. That's the ones that are, yes, yes. Walking on kittens. The anesis. They're like walking on kittens, man. They are so yeah. comfortable. Oh, 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 I just wear them just for fun, man. Okay, in in uh, in in Doha, we got uh, Mohammed and Mohammed working as usual. Very good, excellent. Hope things are safe and are safe there. It's warm in Miami. Uh, let's see, another martini. Sure, <laughs> there we go. And uh, Mar Marty Smith working at home for the past five years. Expert at social distancing. Troubleshooting calls are up. Engineering calls down. Well, there you go. Yep. Yeah, I've been working at home more. Pretty much full time since I think 2006, 2005. I don't think I could go back to an office now. It wouldn't work out well for the people there or for me, I don't think. Uh, how do you receive PDHs? Asked Jonathan Woods. A good question, Jonathan. Tomorrow you will receive in your follow up email, there will be an attachment for you to download a certificate indicating one hour of continuing ed. And um, you can submit that. Uh, that. That should work for you. All right. Thanks a lot for the webinar, Mohammed. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, zero coronavirus in Jordan past one week. Oh, that's good news. That's good news. And you know, we've uh, we're still in the throes of it here, and hopefully, hopefully it's turning. You know, we'll see. We'll see. The weather's getting nicer. People need to need to be outside and doing stuff. We have a uh, every couple of weeks we have a block party on our street where we just get out in our in our lawn chairs and we stay a good six eight feet apart from each other, but just sit in a big you know, up and down the street and yak at each other and walk around a little bit, stay away from each other. But we, we get to get to socialize. And it's it's amazing how the little things in life, like just talking to your neighbors become so important and so satisfying. You know, yeah, I, I, I know how out. my dog feels now. Yeah, you know, every right. time somebody walks by, she's been going nuts for the past nine years. Now I know why I do the that's same right. thing. <laughs> Are you, you're not barking if someone walks by the house. I don't want to know what you do. I'm starting to yeah, yeah. I'm just starting to yell at them now and start, hey, neighbor, how you doing? You know, so, yeah. <laughs> so that's what she's been doing all these years. Now, there you go. Now you know what it's like to be a dog. <laughs> all righty, folks. Um, awesome. Yeah, maybe, and Richard McGrath, maybe, maybe a lot of people remember what it's like to be a human being. I, I think so. I, I hope so. I really do. I mean, this is a, uh, We'll be kinder to one another, be more helpful to one another, and appreciate others for our differences and similarities much, much more than before. So maybe that, maybe something will go to come out of this, and and I hope that's across the world, not just in the U.S. But uh, yeah, without getting too too emotional or sentimental about it, that's that's what I hope for. Anyway, uh, folks, that's it. Thank you so much for your for the gift of your time, and thank you for joining us. Uh, really do appreciate it, and uh, stay with us. And uh, you know, next week. We'll have a commercial presentation with uh, Rich Medeiros and Brett Zerba, and then we'll be back a week after that with another uh, 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 residentially focused one. We do thank you folks for your time. We appreciate you spending a portion of your day with us. And uh, everybody be safe out there and uh, enjoy the day, and uh, we'll see you soon. Take care, everybody. Bye, y'all.